All right, so uh, how many San Francisco 49er fans do we have in the house today? Oh, about eight of you, all right. How many Kansas City Chiefs fans do we have in the house today? How many of you say, I could care less, I'm just watching the commercials tonight. That's all I'm doing. I'm watching the commercials. Well, hey, I'm glad that you've chosen to be here on Super Bowl Sunday. And I would say this, that what is happening right now in this place and in churches all over South Florida is much more important than the Super Bowl. And I'm so glad that you have chosen to be with us here today. Um, can we start with a word of prayer today? I just want to start with a word of prayer. I'm glad you're here. I know there's some visitors here for the first time. I'd love to have the opportunity to meet you, as Brad said, at the conclusion of the service. Whether it's your first time, your 300th time here, whatever it is, man, we just want today's service to be a blessing to you. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your presence in this place. Th thank you that we don't have to beg you to come. We don't have to cajole you to come. But you promise that we're... There's a handful of believers who meet in your name that you were there in their midst. So today, we believe that you're here with us. And we pray that you, Lord, would help us to sense your presence. Help us not only to sense your presence, but I pray that you would speak to us corporately and individually. Help us to see the truths from the passage of scripture that we're going to look at today. Or today as we look at some deep truths for the family. God, you know my heart. and Lord, how, how desperately I want to be able to convey the truth of your word. And I feel so inadequate today. So Lord, somehow, some way, Lord, Lord, I just pray that you'd take the truth of, Lord, what I say, but more importantly, what the scripture says. And drive that home to our hearts. Help us as a church to realize the importance of our families, the importance of fighting for our families, not with our families, but for our families. And God, help us to do that from a biblical perspective. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I think all of us here today are more than willing to fight for and defend our families, right? If you had to, if your family was in danger, no doubt you'd be willing to step up to the plate and you'd be willing to do whatever it took to defend your family, to defend their safety, to defend their security, probably even to defend their honor. So I was thinking about this passage today, I thought about a time when my brother and I, most of you know that I, I have a twin brother, Bruce, and so Bruce and I were seven years old. We had just moved into a brand new house in a brand new neighborhood, and I don't know how long we'd been there, just a few short days, and Bruce and I were out on our bicycles, kind of getting to know the neighborhood just a little bit. We were just about seven years old, when all of a sudden this group of big guys, 15 to 17-year-old kids, but the seven-year-olds, they were like, you know, these huge adult guys. All of a sudden, they came on their bikes, and they surrounded Bruce and I. So I'm the seven-year-old, and I'm absolutely terrified. And, the, and they wouldn't let us leave, and I don't remember the gist of the conversation, but I do remember that they scared us to death. And somehow Bruce and I escaped and we raced back to the house and threw our bikes in the front yard and we ran in and, and we're scared and we're crying. And, and Dad's like, what happened? What happened? And we said, Dad, these big boys surrounded us and they scared us. And my dad comes outside. And you have to understand, uh, my dad's like a very calm, Vicky knows, very calm, mild man. He comes out and he walks out on the street and these boys start riding by. And somehow he picks out the leader of the group and pulls him off of his bicycle and looks at him and says, you will never, ever do that to my boys again. And they ran off and we didn't have any more problems in our neighborhood again. Thank God for a dad who stood up for us and fought for us. I was thinking as well because we not only fight for our safety and security, we fight for our honor. Vicky reminded me of this, that we were in Mexico still, and 
Justin was about eight or nine years old, and, and uh, Mark would have been about five, and Amber was just newborn, and we knew at that time that Amber had some developmental delays and everything, and uh, Justin gets in a fight one day at school. And so we get, I don't know exactly how it happened, so the teacher calls and says, you need to know Justin got in a fight, which wasn't necessarily his thing, and so he comes home that day, and we do the parental thing, sit down, Justin, let's talk about it. you shouldn't fight, you shouldn't hit other kids, you're a pastor's son, so you need to act like a pastor's son, what would motivate you to do that? And Vicky and I will never forget, he looked at us, and his lips started quivering, and he said, Daddy, some little boy at school called my sister dumb, and I wasn't going to let him call her dumb, so I hit him right in the mouth. And I'm like, you go, guy. You go, guy. You, you, you defend your sister. That's what it's all about. Listen, we all understand that. We all have, and as men especially, and even women, we have this. It's like something happens to our family, and the hair on the back of our neck stands up, and our shirt begins to rip, and we become uh, the hawk all of a sudden, trying to defend our families. It's something natural that each and every one of us do. Here's my question this morning, though. The question is this. Are we as willing, though, to fight for the stability and the spirituality of our families as we are to fight for the safety, security, and honor of our families? Think about that because we have a tendency to be willing to fight for one area, but I'm afraid even as Christian families, as Christian moms and dads, as Christian husbands, as Christian wives, that we have a tendency to let other parts of our families fall by the wayside and we don't see the importance of fighting for those aspects of our family as much as we do our safety and security. You know as well as I do that the dynamics of the, fam of the American family are changing. Many families in our country today are not like they were 50 years ago. This is not, I'm going to date myself, this is not Ozzie and Harriet. Anybody remember Ozzie and Harriet? All right. Uh, the millennials are sitting back thinking, who in the world is Ozzie and Harriet? You can, you can Google it. It's not this day and age. Liz Brown, a national columnist, said this in her words. She said, the American family is changing. With divorce, cohabitation, and remarriage on the rise, the two-parent household is no longer a given in the United States of America. And it's not. Let's be honest. It's no longer a given, the nuclear family as we know it, with one mom and one dad and, and two kids, a boy and a girl, or three kids, is not the norm in the United States. And I would say this, it's not the norm in the church either. As I look out at you today, I am fully cognizant of the fact that, that many of us here today have had marriage and family struggles. Some of you here today have experienced divorce. Some of you today have blended families. You have mixed families, and you understand the dynamics and the struggles of that. Others of you have kids who have strayed from the faith, and your heart is burdened about that. In our congregation, we have single moms. We have single dads in our congregation. We, we, we have families that, couples that would love to have kids but have not been able to have kids. I say that because our congregation, our congregation is a diverse array of families. No family is the same. Some of us, myself included, have been bad husbands at time to godly wives. Other godly or other wives have been bad wives to godly husbands. Some of us as parents would admit that we have not been the spiritual leaders that God desires. I see all that all that to say this this morning. First of all, to realize who we are, but even more importantly, for you to know this: that my purpose is not to beat you up this morning. You might sit back and say, oh my word, Brian's going to talk about me, or 
Oh, my word, he's going to make me feel guilty about this. And my purpose, God knows my heart. I've spent a lot of time praying about this the last couple of days. My purpose is to not, you may, not, not make you feel guilty, not beat you up for past mistakes. If you hear anything that I say, hear this today. We live under grace today. And we live under the grace of God And the grace of God is deeper, broader, bigger, greater than all of our sins. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what mistakes you made. It doesn't matter how many times you've been married. It doesn't matter how good or how bad of a father or mother you were in the past. The grace of God covers all of that. So I want you to know my heart today. As we talk about these things, our purpose is not just to make you walk out of here feeling terrible today. That's not the purpose. But as we begin this series that we've simply titled, Fight for Your Family, here's our purpose. Our purpose is to give you biblical convictions. Our purpose is to give you biblical tools to help you fight from this day forward. For your family so that we might have families that truly honor and glorify God so that we might have families who are producing disciples of Jesus Christ so that we might have families that we can lift up to a world and say see the difference of what Jesus Christ makes in a family Family life is tough, is it not? Would anybody agree with me it's tough? Would anybody agree that it's tough to be married? Listen, I'm married to the most wonderful lady in the world, and it's difficult at times, is it not, Vicki? It's difficult. Yeah, I know, yeah. And you're married to the most wonderful guy in the world, so it's difficult for you to come to that conclusion. I get that. Simply not all of us that admit would admit that it's tough. When I do marital counseling, most of the time Vicki's not with me when I'm doing marital counseling, so I can say all kinds of things and she doesn't know what I say. But, but often when I do marital counseling, I tell people, I love my wife every single day. There's days I just don't like her very much. And she loves me every day. There's days that we, you ever been there? I'm being honest, I'm being transparent. You been there? We have days that we struggle. Do we not? And those are the days that we need to live out the truth of the gospel. Sometimes I think, Tim Keller made a great statement, uh, sometimes I think that we think we demonstrate the gospel more when everything is going well, we love each other, we're happy, and there's no problems at all. But I would submit to you this morning that we demonstrate the truth of the gospel more in our marriages and our families when we're having struggles and we're still faithful. When we're, when we're bickering a little bit, but we still demonstrate the love of Jesus. And we still demonstrate affection. Because it is in the difficulties of life that the gospel becomes real to us. And what we want to do in the next couple of weeks is give you some tools to help you. That when difficulties come, because they are going to come. And when challenges come, because they are going to come. How can you and I fight with biblical convictions, with biblical tools, how can we fight and still have families that truly honor and glorify Jesus Christ? So today we want to begin in the very beginning. So if you have your Bible, go with me to Genesis chapter 1. Because if we're going to look at the family, we need to look at when the family originated. And we need to look at when God created the family What was his purpose? What in the world did God have in mind when he not only created Adam and Eve, but he brought them together and he created the family? What was it that God had in mind? So we see that. We see just a couple of really deep, maybe simple, but deep truths in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that I want to share with you today. This isn't going to be ground-shaking. It's going to be simple, but, but these are two deep truths or three deep truths that I want to share with you today. So we're in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Notice what it says. We'll put it up on the screen. Then God said, obviously this is the creation story. God said, sixth day, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. 
Let me pause there for a second because I want you to notice that pronoun, our, or, or even the term uh, us. God says, let us make man in our image. You might sit back and think, who in the world is God talking to? <laughs> All right, man hasn't been created. To whom is God speaking? We believe with all of our heart that us is one of the very first references of the Trinity in the Bible. Us is referring to that inner Trinitarian communication where God the Father is speaking to God the Son and He's speaking to God the Holy Spirit. And here in the very beginning of Scripture, we see the Trinity, though maybe not named, we see the Trinity perfectly illustrated. And by the way, you also see it in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Because you know verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then verse 2 says, And the Spirit of God moved on the waters. We see God the Father creating, speaking the Word, who is Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the what? The Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Holy Spirit of God moving on the waters. So here in the very beginning, we see the existence of this triune God, one God, not three gods, one God manifested in three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So God, speaking with that inner Trinitarian communication, says, let us make man in our image. Let me pause there as well because that phrase, our image, is so powerful. Here's the idea that you and I were made to be like God. Obviously, he's the creator and we are his creatures. Obviously, he transcends us in everything. He transcends us in being. He transcends us in power. He transcends us in glory. The idea is not that you and I will become like gods. That's not the idea in the passage, but there is a sense in which we are like him. And God created us to be like him. You say, Brian, what does that mean? He's given us intelligence. He's given us a a consciousness. He's given us a sense of morality. We are moral agents equipped with mind, heart, and will. He's equipped us as human beings to do things that the rest of creation does not have the ability to do. We also, as we'll see in just a moment, we've been given a purpose. And our purpose is to be the image bearers are the image reflectors of God. So keep reading with me. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Here we find the cultural mandate that we speak of frequently. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God created you in his image. So if you have your outlines today, here's what I want to do, and I've struggled with how to communicate this, and I'm going to confess from the very beginning, I'm not sure whether I'm communicating it very well, but I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit of God to take the truth and drive it home to our hearts and minds today, because I want you to catch these truths. And the first very simply is this, the foundation for the family relationship or the foundation for the family, excuse me, is the relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and we can add God the Holy Spirit. Catch that again. That's deep, it's profound, but at the same time, it's simple. It's tough for us to grasp, even though it might be simple for us to understand. The foundation for the family The foundation for your family, the foundation for my family, is the relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and we can add God the Holy Spirit. Here's a question. Did you ever wonder God or what God was doing before he created the world? Think about that for a second. Sometimes we have a tendency to, our minds are finite, God is infinite, so we have a tendency to think, okay, God began when we began. So so God began when the world began, and that's not true. God existed forever. 
He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He has always existed. We're finite. We are created. He is not. So what was God doing before He created the world? Before He created the world, before He ruled over the world, before He redeemed the world, before He saved us, before He listens to our prayers, before He does any of those things, what was God doing? Did you ever wonder that? The Bible doesn't give us a lot of indication, but there is one verse in Jesus' high priestly prayer that gives us some indication of what God the Father and God the Son were doing before the world was ever created. So, so look with me in John chapter 17 and verse 24. This is the high priestly prayer of Jesus, and I want you to see what Jesus says. It's so profound. Jesus says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me. How cool is that? God wants, Jesus wants you to be with him. He wants me to be with him. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me. Notice this phrase. Because you loved me, what? Before the foundation of the world. So what is that verse telling us? What was happening before the world was ever created. Very simply, God the Father was loving God the Son. And God the Son was loving God the Father. And God the Father and God the Son were loving God the Holy Spirit. Here's what I put in my notes. Before he ever created the world, God was a Father loving the Son. The most foundational thing we know about God is that he is a father. We believe in the eternal fatherhood of God. And we believe in the eternal sonship of Jesus Christ. We don't believe that God became a father when Jesus came to earth and was born. And we don't believe that Jesus became a son when he came to earth and and was born. We believe that from all eternity past, God was God the Father and Jesus was God the Son. We see that throughout Scripture. God is mentioned as a father 15 times in the Old Testament. The use of that description escalates as we get to the New Testament because in the Gospels alone, Jesus refers to God more than 150 times as a father. And he refers to himself more than 30 times as a son. Now, you and I just would sit back, and sometimes, practically, we struggle with theological truth, and we would sit back and say, okay, got it, let's move on. <laughs> what does that mean to me? How does that apply to me? And here's what I want you to catch this morning. First and foremost, God is a father. He is a father in everything he does. Sometimes we'd sit back and think, okay, being a father is his day job, And at night, he goes home and takes off his father hat, and he just becomes God again. No, he is a father in everything he does. He created the world as a father. He rules the world as a father. He disciplines as a father. He provides for our needs as a father. Now, now, now let me pause. I get that some of us struggle with that today. And we struggle with that concept because you didn't have a good experience with your father. You might be here today and you might say, man, Brian, my dad abused me. Or or, or my dad abandoned me. Or or my dad just didn't love me. And so it's hard for me to conceptualize God as a father because I don't have a good view of what a father is. Here's what I want to say to you today. God is not a father because he's trying to copy earthly dads. He's not. He's not some pumped up version of your dad or my dad. He is the supreme example of what a father should be. I would allow you, or I would ask you today, allow him to be your father. I love love that phrase in the Old Testament that says that God is a father to God the fatherless those who don't have a father god is their father here's what i want you to catch the relationship between god the father and god the son 
is the example for us. As we sit back and think, okay, what type of husband should I be? Or what type of wife should I be? What type of dad should I be? Or what type of mom should I be? And the example, the supreme example is this. You should be like God. And the example that God gives us in the very beginning of Scripture is this relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That is the example for us. So let me ask you today, and I know this is, uh, you might sit back and think, boy, this is making my brain work. Well, I like that a little bit. Make your brain work just a little bit. How does God the Father love the God the Son? And how does God the Son love God the Holy Spirit? How, what is love, what is intertrinitarian love look like, and how does that apply to us? Well, first of all, we would sit back and say there is mutual love, one for the other. Over and over again, Jesus talks about how the fact that the Father loved him and how he loves the Father. It, that love is mutual. That love is undemanding. Here's a phrase that we hear a lot in the news today. There is no quid pro quo within the Trinity. So, so it's not like God the Father sat back and said, okay, Jesus, here's the deal. I want you to go to earth, and I want you to take upon human flesh, and I want you to die on the cross, and I want you to rise again. I know that's going to be tough, but I promise if you do that, if you do that for me, here's what I'm going to do for you. If you do that for me, then I'm going to elevate you. And I'm going to make your name above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. If you do that for me, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. The love that the Father has for the Son is not a quid pro quo response. There's an undemanding love from one to the other. That's so important because within our marital relationships, we often demonstrate a quid pro quo love. If you meet my needs, I'll meet your needs. If you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. But here's the deal. If you don't meet my needs, then forget it. I'm not meeting your needs. I'm not going to. That's not the way God loves. And if God is our supreme example, we should love each other the way that he loves. His love is sacrificial. His love is submissive. Think about that. Think about this. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are co-equals. All three of them are in, uh, omnipotent. All three of them are omniscient. All three of them are omnipresent. One is no more powerful than the other. All three of them are 100% God. And yet when Jesus came to earth, he made this statement. He said, I will only do what my Father instructs me to do. Did he do that because he was inferior to the Father? No, he wasn't in fear of the Father at all. It was the submissive love, this mutual submission, one for another. I will do what is best for us. It's submissive love. Church, I say all of that because that is the way that our marriages, that is the way that our families should love one another. The example for, for the family, the example for the home, the example for marriage is not what you and I watch on Netflix. It's not. The example of godly love is none other than God the Father loving God the Son and God the Son loving God the Holy Spirit. That's how we should love one another and I'm afraid even as a church we've been duped we've been duped into believing that love is something that it's not if you want to love treat and respond to your family correctly observe the relationship between God the Father observe the relationship between God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit because before the world was ever created God was a father, loving a son. But here's what I want you to see as we look in Genesis. Like the father and like the son, you were created to live in a relationship with others. Now, I'm not saying that God the father and God the son were created. I'm saying like their attributes, you and I were created to reflect their attributes. 
So, so, so we were made to live in a relationship. Why? Because God is a relational God. Aren't you glad this morning that God's a relational God? If he wasn't a relational God, he could give a flip about you. He, he would just be this God that's up in heaven, disconnected from you completely. But he's not. He's relational. He wants to have a personal relationship with you so much that he humbled himself and became like us. So here's what I want you to catch out of the book of Genesis. Like the Father and the Son, you and I were created to live in a relationship with one another. Go with me to the next chapter, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. We're going to kind of walk through this passage in in just a moment, but I want you to see the beginning of verse 18. So so, um, this is is day six, and, and everything has been created, man has been created, and I want you to catch what, 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 what's said here, because I think it's poignant. Verse 18, chapter 2 and verse 18, we're jumping ahead. You can read it all when you go home today before the Super Bowl. Super Bowl's not till 6.30, so you have plenty of time to read Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. Now think with me what's transpired up to this point. So if you're familiar with Genesis chapter 1, God's creating everything. And you know as well as I do that after he creates everything, he says this phrase, so he creates the firmament, he creates the sky, and he creates the earth, and he looks at it and he says what? Oh, that's good. That's good. And and then he creates the moon and the stars and the sun, and he looks at it and he says what? That's good. That's good. And then he creates the oceans and land, and he separates them. And he looks at that and says, that's good. Then he creates all of the animals, the ones that, that, that walk on the ground, and the ones that fly, and the ones that are in the sea. And he looks at all of his creation, and he says, that's good. Then he creates man. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, and we're going to explain the passage. Adam is alone. He doesn't have a helpmate. And God looks down and for the very first time he says what? That's not good. It's not good that man should be alone. Why is that? Because you and I were created to be in a relationship. That's not saying that we were all created to be married. That's not saying that we were all created to have large families. But we were created to be in a relationship with one another. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans 14, 7, for none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. You were created to be in a relationship with others. You were not intended to live alone. That's why families are so important, and I would say this, that's why a church family is so important. You need to be part of of something and we would encourage you to be a part of a life group in which you are doing life with other people why is that that's what God created us to do he didn't create us to be hermits and to drive into our garage and shut the garage door and not communicate with anybody until we come out he created us to be relational so the very first thing the very first point very simply we see is the foundation of the family is the relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I want you to see a second thing, and I know it might seem like I'm bouncing around, but but please follow me. The second truth is this, and we see this in Genesis chapter 2. Marriage was designed, created, and instituted by God. Notice with me, let's read through Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, and I want to take just a few moments. So it says, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. You might want to circle that word alone. I will make a helper fit for him. In my Bible, I circled a helper fit. I'm going to explain that in just a moment. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every every living creature, that was his name. How cool is that? God looks at Adam and says, hey, I got a job for you. All right. I've created all these animals, but you need to give them names. And so Adam's like, ready, let's do it. And two by two, these animals begin to come before him. And so two elephants come and he looks at him and says, 
elephants. That's just what you look like, elephants, you know. And then, you know, uh, ant eaters make sense. Why? They're eating ants. And so, so he went through and he just named all of the animals. And God gives him, uh, he, he has dominion over the earth as the cultural mandate. So he names all of the animals. Verse 20, the man gave names to all the livestock, to all the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. I, I circled a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed it up in his place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from man, he made, he built, he constructed, is the Hebrew word, into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. By the way, these are the only recorded words before the fall. The only recorded words. And the only recorded words are what? Adam writing a poem for his wife. Guys, you want to show your wife you love her? Write her a poem. And then sing it to her. Roses are red, violets are blue, Vicky, you're beautiful, that's why I love you. There you go. <laughs> Write a poem. I just did that right off the top of my head. That was pretty good, wasn't it? Huh? So, so that's what Adam does. The only recorded words before the fall. And he sits back and he, he uplifts the woman that God had created. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Jose's going to deal with that next Sunday as we talk about fighting for your marriage. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Here's what I want you to catch today, church. The concept of marriage was God's idea. It wasn't, it wasn't a creation of society. It wasn't just that this need existed, and so man said, okay, how, what are we going to do? How can we continue to procreate? How can we live together in harmony? I know. Let's put man and woman together. Marriage was God's idea. He designed it, he created it, and he instituted it. You say, Brian, what does that mean? Oh, it means so much. I'm, I, I'm not... I'm not going to get political this morning, I'm not, but I do have to say this. As the designer, God and God alone can define the parameters of marriage. He is the only one who can create them, who has created them. He's the only one that can define them. Why? Because the creator is the one who sets the parameters for its use. Let me give you an illustration today. Let's say that you went out to come to church today and you noticed that your tank was on empty. Your car tank was on empty. And you're like, oh my word, I start, tried to start the car and it's on empty. I can't start it. And you sit back and thought, man, I don't, I don't have a gas can around. What can I do? And you realize that in your refrigerator you have two gallons of chocolate syrup. And you sit, sit back and say, you know what, there's no gasoline at home. But hey, one liquid is as good as another liquid, right? So I'm going to pour chocolate syrup into my tank. I like the taste of chocolate syrup. Certainly my car is going to like the taste of chocolate syrup. So I'm not going to use gas. I'm going to use chocolate syrup. And you pour chocolate syrup into your car. And you're all excited thinking how smart you are. And you go out and try to start the car. Is your car going to start on chocolate syrup? Why? No, you know it's not. Why? Because a car was not designed to start on chocolate syrup. You might sit back and say, well, that's crazy. Why wasn't it? I think my car should start on chocolate syrup. Quite frankly, no matter what you think, the inventors of the automobile said, no, it's going to function on gasoline. And later on, I know that there's electric cars and all of that. What am I saying? The, event, the inventor, the creator, the designer is the one who sets the parameters. God is not being unloving. He's not being uncaring. He's not being culturally, he's not not being culturally relevant by sitting back saying, no, this is the way marriage should be. He's the designer, he's the creator, he's the institute, the, the, the one who instituted it, and as such, he has the right to make decisions responsible for it. Jesus was asked in Matthew chapter 19 about marriage. Actually, he was asked because 
the Pharisees were wanting to divorce their wives and they were looking for an excuse to divorce their wives. And so they asked him about marriage. And Jesus said this, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning created them male and female? And said, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and the two of them shall be one flesh. God designed marriage. We see that in the very beginning. We can't negate it. We can't deny it. It's the truth. He's the creator of it, and as such, he has the right to set its parameters. I want you to see a second truth that we see in the passage, and ladies, I trust this is a blessing to you. So if if you'll remember in verse verse 18 of chapter 2, the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Often, In our culture, we look at that word helper and we feel like that's a demeaning term. It lowers who a woman is and what her role is. That's simply not the case. And if that's your view of the term, you don't understand the term. Because we've already explained the passage, the term helper in the passage, and I put this in your notes, the term helper in the passage demonstrates Adam's inadequacy and not Eve's inferiority in the passage. I've already explained the passage. All of a sudden, Adam is alone, and he doesn't like being alone. Did you ever wonder, think about this, I'm a a question guy, did you ever wonder why God didn't create Adam and Eve together? Because in the passage, it seems like they're created at two different times, and here Adam is functioning but Eve is not present. Why didn't, Ad, why didn't God create them together? And I think it's really important that God allowed man to recognize a need that he has. To recognize a deficiency that he has. Guys, I know that kind of bursts our bubble just a little bit. But the idea as I see the passage is this. Adam had a deficiency. He was not created to be alone. Does that relate to anybody else? I, I get that. I go crazy when I'm alone. A couple weeks ago, Vicki went up to Wisconsin for a few days, and, and if you're like me, so, so this is the way it plays out with me when I'm alone. First day when she leaves, I get home, and it's like, yes, I'm by myself. I can eat whatever I want. I can watch whatever I want on television. I can do whatever I want. I'm alone. Vicky's gone. That's like for the first hour or two. And then after a couple hours, a couple a day, it's like, man, I miss her. I miss her. It's not fun being by myself. And I start calling her incessantly, like every, every 20 minutes. Hey, babe, what are you doing? You know, and she's like, Same thing I was doing 20 minutes ago when you talked to me or something like that. So she's actually told me at times when I've called her, we've been separated, she said, you've already called me like 10 times today. I love you, I care for you, don't call me again. (laughs) She just, don't don't call me again. What am I demonstrating? I can't function alone. I need a help me. I need someone to come alongside So that the term helper in the passage is not demeaning to the woman. It's uplifting to the woman. I would actually show you something else. That same Hebrew word that is translated helper here in Genesis chapter 2.18 is used repeatedly in the Old Testament for none other than God himself. That phrase. Psalm chapter 33 and verse 20, our soul waits for the Lord, for he is our helper and shield. Guess what word is used? The exact same Hebrew word of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. Psalm 121, 2, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Guess what word? Same word found in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. And if that doesn't convince you, I remind you of the words of Jesus before he left in John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus said, I'm leaving, but I'm not going to leave you alone. John 14, 6, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another, guess what word is used? Helper. Helper to be with you forever. 
Ladies, catch this. Please, 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 please catch this. I propose this morning that you, as a wife, are more like God when you help your husbands than at any other time in your marital relationship. That's what you've been called to do. That's not demeaning. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. He comes alongside of us and he helps us. And ladies, you were created to help us become what God intends for us to be. And we were placed at your side to help you become who God wants you to be. That is a very high calling. And when we understand that, it changes how we understand marriage. And so I would say this in your outline, I would say this marriage is a complementary relationship and that man and woman were created to fulfill, to complement each other's needs. I would say this, that one of the most practical truths that any husband and wife can learn is this, you were brought together to meet each other's needs. Newsflash, men, your wife's needs are different than yours. They're not the same as yours. They're different. One author says this, that a wife's five top needs are affection, conversation, honesty, openness, financial stability, and family support. While a man's top five needs are physical intimacy, home management, admiration, recreational companionship, and attractive spouse. Completely different lists. And as we meet with men sometimes, sometimes, guys, we're so hard-headed, we're thick-headed, we don't get it. We think as long as, excuse the graphicness of my conversation, as long as there's physical intimacy between my wife and I, that everything is good. And she doesn't need physical intimacy with you, but what she needs is for you to sit down and have a conversation with her. And what she needs is stability in the home. And God says, I'm going to bring these two people who are completely different. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. I'm going to bring these two people who are completely different together in a unique way so that they can complement each other, satisfy each other's needs, and thus glorify God. Once again, it's not a quid pro quo. You have a responsibility to meet your spouse's needs regardless of whether he or she is meeting yours. Marriage was defined by God. I want to give you a, a third thing, and I'm done, all right? The third thing is this. Let me go ahead and give it to you, and then I'm going to read it to you. The purpose of the family is to produce and raise up image reflectors of God. The purpose of the family is to raise up image reflectors of God. Would you go with me to the last book of the Old Testament? I found a passage in the book of Malachi that just absolutely hit me between the eyes. I've read it before, but I, I never really caught it before. And I want you to see this, and I want you to see it in its context. So Malachi the prophet writes to the Jewish people, and he's basically condemning the Jewish people for not doing two things. First of all, that they weren't faithful in their offerings. God, God was blessing them, and they were being selfish. They were holding on to it, and they weren't giving back to God, and, and, and the prophet condemns them for that. But the second thing he condemns them for is because these Jewish men were divorcing their Jewish wives, and they were marrying pagan wives, and then they were wondering why God was not blessing them. And, and so catch this. In Malachi chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, and the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Why, why is God not responding to our offering? Why is God not answering our prayers? You say, why does he not? And the prophet says, because the Lord was a witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithful. As you divorced her and you married a pagan wife, you've been faithful. Though she is your companion, catch this phrase, if you underline in your Bibles, underline this phrase, and the wife of your covenant. You've been faithless, well, she is your companion and the wife by covenant. Jose's going to talk about that next week. Marriage is not a commitment. It's a covenant. It's a covenant between three people. It's a covenant between you, your spouse, and God. When we view it as a commitment, we, will, we can walk away from it. When we view it as a covenant, we can't. 
And the prophet Malachi says, man, you've been unfaithful to the wife of your youth, the wife of your covenant. Notice, did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? Two believers coming together, the Spirit joining them together. Notice this phrase. And what was the one God seeking? Question mark. What does he say? Godly offspring. Does that hit you between the eyes? Like it does me? God says, listen, here's what I want you to catch. The reason that we bring two believers together the, the reason that they are brought together in their marriage, obviously we want them to have joy, we want them to have happiness, we want them to satisfy each other's needs. But we're bringing them together for the purpose of producing godly offspring. Church, please catch this today. The purpose of the family is to produce and raise up image reflectors of God. That's what the purpose of the family is. You might sit back today and say, praying, how do we do that? How do we manage our families? How do we love our kids in such a way that they will reflect the image of God? Let me give you two things, and I'm done today. The first is this. Make a choice that you and your family will serve the Lord. Make a choice that you and your family will serve the Lord. Remember the story of Joshua? Yeah, Joshua, so, so, so the people of, of Israel were having a tendency to father, f- follow other gods. And at the end of, book of, jo- of the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, Joshua makes, he takes a stand. And he said this, he said, it doesn't matter what you are going to do. He says, but as for me and my family, here's what we're going to do. We will serve the Lord. You might have that hanging up in your house. What is that? That's a choice. That's a choice that you will serve the Lord. You say, Brian, what does that look like? What does that look like practically? Here's what it means. It means that you choose spiritual activities over secular activities. Uh, Let me give you a quick testimony. So when uh, when I was 12 years old, my brother and I were star baseball players. I know you look at me and you see this athletic form and it doesn't surprise you a bit, but Bruce and I, were, were, we were star baseball players. I mean, we really were. I can give you all of my statistics if you want to later on. When I was 12, we were the stars. So we get to 13 and we're all-stars. We're perennial all-stars every single year. And all of a sudden, we get to these bigger leagues and, and this whole area that's our, the, the, that's our school system in. They come together for tryouts for the big teams. And Bruce and I show up that day and the coach comes up and he says, you guys don't even need to try out. Your pick's number one and pick's number two. I want the Burke holders on my team. Here's what I, we were good baseball players. We, we played a year under that system. The next year they changed. This was before travel ball. The next year they changed and the coach came back and said, okay, man, we're excited about this season. We're going to be playing on Sundays from now on. And my brother and I and my mom and dad, we had a choice to make. We were pretty good at what we did. Are we going to choose the secular activity? over a spiritual activity. And we chose as a family, no, the spiritual activity is more important. And I walked away from, who knows, I'd probably be playing in the major leagues right now. I'd probably be playing for the Marlins or something like that in the major leagues. Here's what we did. We chose the spiritual over the secular. I've never regretted it. It was one of the best decisions of my life. Choose the spiritual over the secular. Here's here's another thing. Make a discipleship in church a priority. Priority. And live what you preach. Moms and dads, live what you preach. Your kids have this sixth sense. They can detect hypocrisy from a mile away. And if you say one thing but live another, your kids catch that. Decide that you will serve the Lord. And the last thing is this, be a prayer warrior for your spouse and your kids. Be a prayer warrior. Without, it, without any doubt, the most important thing you can do for your wife, husbands, the most important thing, ladies, you can do for your husband, the most important thing you can do for your kids is pray, intercede, cry out to God for your kids. You might be like the lady who grabbed me last week and said, Brian, I've shared the gospel with my kids, but they won't accept this. What, accept it. What do I do? You pray. 
You pray because you can't convince them. You're not the great convincer. You're not the great debater. But you have the Holy Spirit of God who is the great evangelist living within you. And you pray that the Holy Spirit of God does what only He can do in the lives of your family. Church, let's fight for our families. Let's fight for our families. Like we fight for their safety, like we fight for their security, like we fight for their honor. Let's fight for their spirituality because we're in a world that is battling us with a ferociousness that we can't understand. It's countercultural what we're talking about today, but it's not impossible because we serve the God of the possible who can do the impossible in our lives. Have you committed your marriage to God? Maybe it's been a long time since you've done that. Have you committed your family to God? Maybe it's been a long time since you've done that. I'd encourage you as we begin the series to make a decision like Joshua. We will fight for our families. And the devil can come after us with all he's got, but we're going to fight our family with the word of God. We're going to fight our fam- with our, for our family with prayer, with the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And we're going to trust God to do in and through our families what only He can do. Would you stand with me today and let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the example of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Thank you for that love, that eternal, submissive, undemanding love that is, that is exemplified in the Trinity. Help us to have that in our families. Help us to be husbands who deeply, deeply love our wives and are committed to our wives. Help us wives to be deeply committed to our husbands. I pray for parents, whether, whether traditional, whether single moms, single dads, as parents, help us to be committed to fight for our families. It's worth the fight and help us to commit ourselves to you. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.